If you have your Bibles, turn me down just a little bit. If you have your Bibles this morning, stand with me, you would please, for the reading of God's Word found in the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53. If you can find the... It's in the Old Testament. If you can find Psalms, just go forward. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and then Isaiah. Isaiah 53. I'm reading from a teacher from the New International Version of the Bible. So if you had a King James, the word would be just a little bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Isaiah 53, starting with verse number 1. When you have that, say amen. amen. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4 says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God and smitten by him and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought peace upon us. Uh, the, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one have turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was opposed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, verse 7 says. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before his, her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich uh, in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And, through the, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see the offspring and pro prolong his days, and the, Lord, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Verse number 11, And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide their spoil with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressor. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Give us a keen awareness of exactly what Jesus did for us so that we could come into a relationship with you. And Father, we pray this morning again, if there's any here that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today you'll speak to their hearts clearly, that they'll see the great price paid by Jesus and recognize that this is the only way to get to heaven is through the gift that Jesus offers. Nothing good in us all about you. Speak to our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. We, uh, we talk about, as we get close to Easter, we talk about the death of, of Jesus and exactly you know, what happened at the cross at Calvary that day. Uh, and sometimes I'm not sure we understand the magnitude of exactly what Jesus did for us. And the book of Isaiah begins to lay out the picture of exactly what happened at Calvary that day. Now we know that if you read in the Gospels, you read the account of the physical, the physical that was on Jesus. And if you've seen, if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, anybody seen that movie? It's probably about as accurate a depiction of a Roman crucifixion that you'll see. Um, again, the Roman this this punishment, this death was not unique to Jesus. This is how Romans killed people. And it was done in public because it was a deterrent. 
All right, they would hang them on the side of the roads as a deterrent so that other criminals around would see and say, you know what, I don't want to go through what that dude's going through. And so Jesus wasn't, so we don't have any misconceptions, Jesus wasn't the only person to ever be crucified. As a matter of fact, in A.D. 70, after about, about 40 years or so after the death of Jesus, Rome came into Jerusalem and turned it upside down and destroyed it and hung and crucified the Jews in Jerusalem. Uh, there were so many that were being hung and murdered in that day that the historians actually wrote that it would look like blood running through the streets like a river that there was that many people being crucified. And so we know that this wasn't unique to Jesus, but what was unique to Jesus is the purpose he was being crucified, the purpose that God had behind it. Now to understand it fully, we've got to go back to Genesis chapter 3 when, when we find out that God put, uh, had put man in the garden and told him he could eat of any of the fruit of the garden that he wanted to as long as he didn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil for the, when the day he ate in that he would die. And we, we know that he didn't die that day, but he began the spiritual journey of, of death uh, and the physical journey of death. He, he got a death sentence. He traded in immortality for mortality is what happened in the garden. And uh, so they eat from the fruit that God told them not to. Uh, God comes and he says, what are you doing? You messed up. He drove them out of the garden. And now uh, he tells, he punishes the man. He punishes the woman. He punishes the devil. And he tells the devil, well, let's look at Genesis chapter 3 just so that we can have a reference. Hold your place in Isaiah because I will be back there in just a second. But let's look at Genesis chapter 3 for just a minute uh, so that we can have a reference of what's going on here. And if you look at verse 16, well, actually, let's look at uh, um, verse um, 14. All right, they've ate, they've ate the fruit. The man blames the woman. <laughs> sort of how it goes. The man blamed the woman. The woman blamed the serpent. the serpent. You know, everybody passed judgment. Everybody passed blame. But God passed judgment. So in Genesis 3.14, it said, God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, all the wild animals, you'll crawl on your belly, you'll eat dust all the days of your life. Now look here what he says in verse 15. I will put an end to me between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, you will strike his heel. This is speaking of Jesus. And so God put down this sentence that no matter how much the devil thought he was going to get away with stuff, there was going to be this enemy between them, and eventually God's seed would crush the devil. And so we, we fast forward to about thousands of years later to when Jesus shows up on the scene, and in Isaiah 53 it gives a depiction of what happened at the cross that day. And so let's go back to Isaiah, uh, and I want to I want to look through this for just a minute uh, with you for just a second, and, and let's talk about some of this. It says um, in verse four of Isaiah fifty three, surely he took our infirmities, he carried our sorrow, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. He was now this is talking about the physical here. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. And so what God done in his infinite wisdom, he knew that you and I could never live up to be good enough to be holy and righteous enough to obtain access to God. If you remember, even in the Old Testament, uh, when, when Moses showed up and, and he wanted to see God, he had to turn his back. He couldn't look at God in the face. And so God knew that in all of us in this room, nothing that we'd done, no matter how good we were, no matter how good moral people we were, no matter what kind of standing that you had in the society or in your community, no matter how well you treated people or how good you played by the rules, none of that would measure up enough to get us right with God. 
And then the Old Testament system of the sacrifices, well, that was only good for, for once a year. And then they had to come back, and every year they had to redo that over and over and over again. And so God in His wisdom said, once and for all, I'm going to make the final sacrifice so that man in, in his humanity can have access to me and not have no longer kill goats, you know, so we don't have to come in here and up on this table and take a goat and cut his neck off and all, you know, all that stuff and that they did back in those days and drain its blood and sprinkle it around, you know, because there was a lot of ramifications with that. A lot of times when the priests would go into the holiest of holies, they had a rope tied around their leg with bells on it. Because if the priest wasn't clean enough and he got in the holiest of holies before God, God would strike him down. Now, why the, why the rope and the bells? Well, if when he was doing his duty in there with the sacrifices, the bell would jingle. If the bell quit jingling, they pretty much figured that God had struck him dead and the rope was on there so that they could yank him out so that they didn't have to go in there to the holiest of holies where the presence of God was. And so God in his wisdom said, okay, no longer am I going to require man to offer sacrifices. No longer am I going to try to make you think that you've got to live it to be good enough. I'm going to send the sacrifice that's going to take care of everything. And so what happened on Calvary that day, yes, he had crowns of thorns placed on his head. Yes, before they took him to Calvary, he was beaten to within an inch of his life. Now understand, the Romans were experts at this. They knew exactly how many times to whip somebody with a Roman cat of nine tails. Uh, they knew exactly how many lashes to give them that it would, would take them almost to death, but not kill them. And so if you can imagine for just a minute a... a, a, a a broom handle and off of that there's these leather straps and in these leather straps at the end of that was a piece of bone fragments tied at the end and so they would take this whip and would come over the back and as they come over the back those leather those leather leather uh, fingers would come over and those bone fragments would grab into the skin and literally just rip it off when they pulled it back and so by the time Jesus is taken to the cross, literally the majority of his flesh off his back was ripped off. You could More than likely you would have been able to see inside of his, his rib cavity and all that stuff. All right? They did that. Then they took him to the cross and they ran nails in his hands and in his feet. Now, you've heard me talk about this before. There's no way they put him here. Couldn't have. Okay. Because what happened in a crucifixion was you're, you're struggling to breathe. And so every time you're trying, you're trying to breathe, you're trying to pull up. And as you pull up, the weight of the body would have ripped this out. Because the more weaker you get, the more you slump forward. So the actual place would have probably been right here. Because this bone is thick enough to hold the weight. Now we know from historical accounts or, or seeing, uh, actually finding fossils of, of people that they either overlapped the feet and ran a nail straight down through both of them or they put each foot ankle on the side of the cross and went in sideways. And so yes, there was this physical stuff that was done. If, and what we would consider today torture for those people that are against the death penalty today what America does with either the electric chair or the gas chamber let me tell you something honey that is cakewalk compared to what they did 2,000 years ago I'm telling you if, if you got a way to die let them stick some drugs in your body and put you to sleep and kill on out or let them put some electric to you and get it done quick this lasted sometimes Roman crucifixions would last for days Jesus lasted about six hours. Can you imagine days? Yeah. So we know the physical stuff that was on him, but what was happening in the spiritual? What was happening in the spiritual? Well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says it was God's will to crush. Think about that for just a minute. It was God's will to crush Jesus. Why? Because all the sins of humanity were placed on Jesus' back so that everything you and I needed to pay for, we didn't have to. But what it took... You see, you understand that there's a change between the God of the Old Testament to the God of the New Testament.
There, when you begin to look at the Old Testament, and here's the, here's the argument that sometimes we get into in, in the political realm when we're talking today about, we hear, you hear this stuff on the news about ISIS and the beheadings and all that stuff, and we begin to talk about, well, don't get on your, you know, don't get on your high horse because Christians done stuff thousands of years ago. The difference was is this, is that when Jesus come along, the Old Testament was done away with. He's the new covenant, okay? God in, his, in the Old Testament had to settle his anger with humanity. God at Calvary settled his anger once and for all so that God no longer in this generation is angry with man any longer because he poured it all out on Jesus. He crushed him to the point that all of his anger, all of his wrath was poured out on Jesus at the cross. That was what was going on in the supernatural. God was taking every sin you and I would ever commit, every sin that you and I would ever do, every failure that we would ever have, and he poured it all out on Jesus and literally crushed him. You remember when Jesus said in, in, the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God literally turned his back on Jesus and now Jesus is feeling the full weight of all the sins of humanity. All the anger of God that he had had all down through the generations. God would no longer be angry with mankind because he would settle his wrath at the cross. And so when, when Jesus asked that question, why have you forsaken me? We don't have the answer back from God, but the answer probably looks like this. I'm forsaking you so I don't have to forsake them. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews says that with confidence that my God will never leave me nor forsake me. You have that confidence now that never again will God turn his back on you as a believer because everything that you deserved got poured out on Jesus that day. You see, you know, here's what I'm trying to get at is that we focus on what happened to him physically and that was brutal in and of itself. But there was more going on than just the physical torture that Jesus went through. There was this spiritual thing going on that God was transferring all of our penalty off of us and onto Him. And so that's why when we get to the book of John, we read in the third chapter, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him should not perish but have what? everlasting life. All right, so, so God sent Jesus into the world to take the punishment that you and I deserve. And so now we can, you know, people may get these things, you know, going on. You know, when, when a tragedy comes along or a hurricane, you know, or, or an earthquake or something that devastates a lot of stuff, you'll get these pundits on TV to make the, the, ask the question, you know, why is God angry? Why did God allow this to happen? Why is God punishing? You know, when, when New Orleans got... When New Orleans got flooded with hurricane, uh, they all asked, well, is God punishing? No, no. 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 If your house burns down today, it's not because God's mad at you. If a tornado comes next week and tears Jack down and levels all of this, it's not because God's mad at us. God's anger was finished at Calvary. Now what he leaves him behind is for every man is just a decision. You've got to make a decision now. I've settled this. Now you've got to make a decision. And he gives two consequences. You make the decision to trust Jesus and you'll have abundant life in this life. According to John 10.10, 10, so uh, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy, but I've come to give them life and that they may have it more abundantly. So you can have life and abundance in this life and eternal life in the life to come. Or make no decision and suffer punishment at the end. Okay? Now, it's not punishment because he's mad at you at the end. It's punishment because you failed to make a choice. And really, there's no such thing as failing to make a choice. You made a choice when you didn't make a choice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, to choose, to not to choose is to choose. And so when you say, well, I don't need Jesus, I don't want Jesus, I don't need none of that Jesus stuff, I don't need none of that church stuff, then you're making a choice. You're saying, okay, I don't need God. And God's saying, well, I loved you so much that I gave you an opportunity. Now, if you're going to reject me, let's look, John chapter 3. 
See, because here's what we do. We read John, John chapter 3, and we read the, the 16th verse, and everybody knows it. But can you quote me 17 and 18? Most people can't. So let's look. John 3.16 says what? Okay. All right. Hold on. This is this is interaction time now. All right. Y'all supposed to, you know, uh, you may not be used to that here. I don't know if y'all are not, but I, I I like the the aspects of the black church where they talk back to you, you know. So I, I like to incorporate some of that. So it's interaction time. So John three sixteen says. There you go. Okay, you could pretty well, most of y'all could pretty well quote that without even looking at it. Because we've seen it so much. Go to baseball games. You ever seen on TV baseball, somebody holding up a sign that says John 3.16? We, we know that. And we quote that, but we stop right there. Look at the next verse. For God did not send His Son into the world to what? So God's purpose of sending Jesus wasn't to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. In Genesis chapter 3, the condemnation came. What we do now is that we classify stuff. We say, well, I drank and I smoke and I done drugs, so I'm a sinner. No, you're not. You're not a sinner because you smoked or drank or done drugs or run around or cheated or whatever. That doesn't make you a sinner. What makes you a sinner is that you were born. That's it. You woke up in this world as a baby and you automatically got to sin nature all the way back from Adam and Eve. Now out of that sin nature produces fruit which is drinking and drugs and running around. And of course, we classify the big stuff, right? You know, and so we pick on people who are, are doing the big stuff without thinking about the little stuff. Lying is as bad as drinking and running around. Talking about somebody behind their back or gossip or some of that stuff is just as wrong. It's just as much a sin as it is if you were sleeping around with somebody. So it's not the, it's not the fruit that's the problem. It's the nature and you inherited the nature. Think about this for just a minute. You got little kids. Everybody's got has got little kids or had little kids at one point in their life. Did you have to teach them how to lie? No. Let them mess up. Let them do so. Now, for a little while, they they're all sweet and innocent, right? You know, they don't know. Doo, 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 you know, but they get to a certain age where you you'll say, uh, "Little Johnny, did you do that?" Oh no no, little Johnny not do doing nothing like that. No no, it was her. And little Johnny knows that he done that, but little Johnny's not going to take the blame. You didn't have to teach him to do that. Why? He's got a sin nature. We were born like this. So it's inherited in the human, human DNA, this sin nature. The only cure for the sin nature is the blood of Jesus. And so we begin to look and say, well, you know, these people drink and they cuss and they smoke. But those people look back at us and say, well, you know what? Y'all hypocrites. Because you go to church and you act as bad as we do. And you know what? They're actually right. Some of the meanest people I ever met in my life was in church. I got a preacher friend of mine who's, I don't know, he's 74, 75. And we were talking, we were talking one day and he said, son, he said, I've been doing ministry, uh, you know, I think 60 years or something. He said, son, I'm going to tell you the truth. You'll get treated better in a bar by a drunk man than you will sometimes in the church. And he's actually probably uh, right. Because we classify and tell people, well, you, I don't do what you do. And so I'm better than, you know, and we're not, we don't really say this, but this is exactly what we're saying. I'm really better than you are. No, you're not. We're no better than anybody else out there who doesn't know Jesus. We're no better. We are as much a mess as they are. The difference, 
We've asked Jesus to come in our hearts. That's it. That's it. So don't run around hollering about, well, I read my Sunday school quarterly for the last 25 years. I'm somebody special. No, you're not. I'm glad you did it, but you're not. The only thing that makes you any different than anybody else is the fact that you accepted the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That's it. And so it's the friends of yours that are doing things that they need to quit doing, introduce them to Jesus. I told you, I hate to pick on him. No, I really don't hate to pick on him. I love to pick on this guy. But when I met this guy 20 years ago, was the was the worst day of his life when he met me. I'm just telling you. His life was changed forever. When I met this guy, we were going down his road visiting people in the community. And the man that was with me and Pam said, don't stop at that house. He, this guy's a lost cause. And I said, well, why you figure that for? And he said, well, you need to know about this guy. I said, okay, what is it? He sings in a rock and roll band in a bar. There's no hope for him. And I said, well, brother, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I, I, we're not going to know unless we stop and knock on the door. So we stopped and knocked on the door. Now, this is a big boy. And at that time, I weighed about 150 pounds, six foot tall, about 150 pounds. I was a bean pole. And I got out of the car and went, and knocked on the, went to head towards the door. And here comes this big dude out on the porch. What do you want? I said, uh, 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 sir, I was the preacher from, 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 from the church down the road. Do you want to go to church or not? <laughs> and so he said he'd think about it and stuff like that, you know. And, and uh, I don't know, was it two weeks later or something? Greg came to church and after that got saved and God just transformed his life. But, but here's what people are saying. Well, he's singing a rock band. So? So? Cannot God overcome that? But what we do is we identify the, the individual stuff that we do wrong. and say, well, you know, I don't do that, so I'm a little bit... I don't, I've never OD'd on drugs, so I'm better than everybody else in the community. No, you're not. The same thing they need is the same thing you need, and it's Jesus. So it's, it's the nature we're born with. You can clean up the stuff. You can quit OD'ing on heroin. All these people that are dying in this community from heroin, they can quit dying from ODing on heroin, but that ain't going to get them to heaven. The only thing that's going to get them to heaven is their understanding that they need Jesus. And now let's take it to the extreme for the religious extremists who think that you've got to work and work and work to get to heaven, that you somehow got to be good enough. Let me ask you this question. How good is good enough? You can't answer that question. Because the truth that well, actually, you can't answer that question. Good is not good enough. What happened that day at Calvary was that God placed on Jesus everything, all of his anger, all of his wrath, all of our sins, all of our transgressions, and he literally crushed him so that he wouldn't have to be angry with us any longer. Now, does that mean that, that we can just do whatever we want? No. Well, actually it does mean you can do whatever you want, but there's consequences to it. So you don't have to accept Jesus. God's not going to condemn you for not accepting Jesus because the Scripture says in John the 17th verse, John chapter 3 verse 17, for God didn't send Jesus in the world to condemn the world because the world was what? He was already condemned. So God, you know, we shame people when they don't come to church. And we shame people when they don't live Christian life. And we shame people when they fall. I can't, you know, we'll, you know, uh, <laughs> we'll make phone calls. Okay, did you hear what they done? I, honey, I cannot believe what they done. <laughs> you know, well, I would never do that a thousand, I'd never get a divorce. I'd never get a divorce, not a thousand years. The thing about it is you ain't spoke to your husband in the last 20 and you living together and, and, and not even married, really. <laughs> but pick on the brother who, you know, got out. <laughs> Listen, divorce is, uh, let me just say this, I'm off the topic. Divorce is not a piece of paper. We've turned it into that in America. Divorce is not a piece of paper. 
Divorces in your heart. You can be right here today living with your spouse and hate that sucker you sitting by and won't speak to him. You've already divorced that, that dude. I got a friend whose mom and dad's been married 40, almost 50 years. They've been divorced for the last 30, but live together. Because his mama said, it's wrong, we get a divorce. God don't want us to get a divorce. So they live together, and he don't even live in the house any longer. He's done moved out with, with a family member, but for, for about 20 years, he lived upstairs, she lived downstairs, and they wouldn't speak to each other. For 20 years, how can you live in the same house with somebody for 20 years and not speak to them? They wouldn't even speak to each other. But they thought they had it all together and was doing okay because, you know, they hadn't got a piece of paper. It's, it's a heart issue, man. So don't pick on the brother who's got, got the piece of paper. If you've got the same issue, you just didn't get the paper. See, it all comes from the same thing. It comes from the nature. And the only way to get uh, through with the nature is to get Jesus. Now let's look at this last, this last part here, and, and I'll be done. Look at verse uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now look here. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Okay, let's settle at this because so many Christians struggle with this. Because they feel guilty about stuff. If you've believed in Jesus, you're not what? You're not condemned. Okay? So let me say this. Quit letting, quit letting church people talk you into being condemned. If you believe in Jesus, you are not condemned. Quit letting church people talk you in to being guilty. And we're good at that. Mess up one time. Mess up one time. And see what people do. So, whoever believes that Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. For what reason? Because, because it says there, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not, look at your scripture, whoever does not believe in Jesus is condemned because of all of his sins. Is that what that says? No. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say he's, con he's condemned because of all of his sins. It doesn't say he's condemned because he committed adultery. It doesn't say he's condemned because he stole money from the bank. It says he's condemned for what reason? Because he didn't believe in the name of Jesus. So what, what am I getting at? The bottom line is this, is that there's equal level ground at the cross. We got to quit categorizing people's sins, folks. Because we're all sinners who need a Savior. And what Jesus done for us at Calvary was allowed God to absolutely crush Him and turn His back on Him so that He would never have to crush us or to turn His back on us ever again. You say, well, what about going to hell? Well, you're going to hell not because you're such a bad person, not because you're a sinner. You're going to hell because you hadn't believed in Jesus. Now, the way to fix that is to believe in Jesus. And why, does so, why, why is it such a struggle? Why is it such a struggle to believe that you could be saved? Because I'll be, I'll talk, I've talked to people for the last 25 years about this stuff. And, and, and they'll say, well, you, preacher, you just don't know me. You just don't know the stuff I've done. You just don't know what I'm doing right now. Honey, I don't need to. Because I know somebody who already knows what you've done and has decided to die for you anyways. You just got to receive it. Now, should there be some change? Absolutely. When you get in touch with Jesus, when you get your life transformed, you go from singing in a rock and roll band to pastoring a church. That's what happens. Now, not necessarily, not, uh, hold it. Not everybody's going to be preachers, all right? But you see the trans, you see, understand what I'm talking about the transformation. God's going to change your life when you really get in touch with God. When you really get saved, God's going to transform your life. You're not, you're not going to be the person that you used to be. Your life's going to change. Now, does that mean 
that this brother over the, the 20 years has, has not had struggles with honey, I'm going to tell you something. This boy has wore me out for, for the 20. He's just now that uh, I've transferred him over to Kathy. <laughs> because, uh, yes, yeah, she's worn out already too, you know. <laughs> but he, under, you know what I'm saying, the struggles. You still have struggles as a believer to be where you need to be. And I tell you today that I'm not where I need to be. But I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Why? Not because I'm good, but because I ran into somebody who was willing to be crushed so that I could be what I could never be on my own. And you know what I did to get it? Nothing. I didn't deserve it. I just said, I believe. And I... I know it sounds, yeah, that's all it takes. And I know it sounds hard. But th you know why it sounds hard? Because we've had church people tell us, quit drinking, quit smoking, quit cussing, and go to church. And so then when you mess up, you know, they, they, they look at the, the fruit. And it's not the fruit that's the issue, it's the nature. You've got to get rid of this. You've got to get rid of the nature. And the only way you're going to get rid of the nature is Jesus. That's it. So let me ask you a question this morning. I want you to be really honest. Have you really dealt, really, with the nature? Or are you still trying to clean up all the fruit? The quit, you know, all the sins. You're trying to quit doing all that stuff. But somehow or another, you keep messing it up. And every time you mess it up, you keep feeling guilty. And you don't want to go to church. And you don't want to pray. You know, and somebody's beating you down because you, you messed up again. Honey, listen. You're going to mess up the rest of your life. Take care of the nature. And God will take care of the fruit. But you've got to get Jesus first. And so I, I want to ask you this morning, are you here today and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart? You've never, you're never asked Him to be your personal Savior? Maybe today you've been in church your whole life, but you've been trying to, to do all the works when the work's already been done for you 2,000 years ago. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart, I want to challenge you this morning to come and to just, you know, it's easy as, okay, God, I believe. I don't understand it all, but I believe. I believe that you died for me and I'm willing to ask you to come into my heart and to forgive me of my sins. And that's all it takes. You know, us Baptists, we get all systematic about things and we want the ABCs and the one, two, threes and you put the left foot in, you take the left foot out, you know, you do, you twist, you know, you do all this stuff and then maybe you might be saved. It's as easy as saying, God, I repent. Forgive me. And so if you're here today and you've never made that step, I want to challenge you to do that. Or maybe you're here today and you're not where you need to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been up to this point trying to work your way into heaven. You don't have to work no longer. What happened that day at Calvary was the great exchange. God taking what you couldn't pay for and giving the bill to Jesus. And Jesus paying the bill and returning to you a slip that said paid in full. You just got to be willing to accept it. Let's stand on our feet.